uh, I am, I, I, there's a story that is told about uh, a man, a wealthy man, who uh, lived out on the West Coast and he had made a, a good living for himself and decided uh, to buy a lot of nice things. One of the nice things he decided to buy one day was a Rolls Royce. Now Rolls Royce is a very nice car. Uh, anybody who's a gearhead in here knows a thing or two about the luxury of a Rolls Royce. Um, this individual has said, you know what, I, I'm going to live at the, at the peak of uh, the peak of luxury, and I'm going to get a nice car. The best thing about a Rolls Royce is the claim that they never break down. Right? So, carrying on, he, he buys the car, he has it imported, he's driving it around, and one day the unspeakable happens. The car breaks down. Now, that's no good, that's not good news because that's, that goes against everything that he was told. So he calls up the company and says, hey, I just need you to know this is what's going on. You guys need to fix this. So that day, that hour, they get a mechanic. They put him on a plane from France. They fly him over to the West Coast. He comes in. He fixes the car. He leaves. And this, this man was, was grateful. There was a lot of work that goes into doing that. They did a lot to, to fix the car. And he thinks, well, I'm going to have to, you know, pay this mechanic at some point in time, which is fine. They, they've done a lot of work, and he, he's a man of wealth, so it doesn't matter to him. But as time goes on, days, weeks, even months go by, and he's never charged for the mechanic. So he calls the company back, and he says, excuse me, there was a mechanic that came out a while back. He came, he fixed my car, there was something wrong with it. I just, I want to settle things up, make sure that I, I've, I've paid my account with you guys. And a woman on the other end of the phone says, well, sir, we don't have any record that there was ever anything wrong with your car. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? And that, that is a, an interesting story because obviously that's, that's a car company trying to cover themselves. But it is an interesting concept, right? It's an interesting concept that even though there was something wrong, it's as though, and, and we can pretend as though it never happened. There's no record that it ever even happened, that it never even existed. Today I'm going to be in Romans chapter 8. The book of Romans uh, has a special place in a lot of our hearts, I believe. And rightfully so. It's a very powerful letter that Paul writes. It deals with a lot of very real issues. It deals with a lot of real personal issues, real spiritual issues, and it challenges the way that we view God and view what is spiritual. Chapter 8 is really the pinnacle of the book of Romans. After Paul has spent so much time explaining to people how it is that we're justified, how it is that we have received reconciliation, how it is that through Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus alone, we have the opportunity to put sin aside and to be free from sin. Not only that, or not only are we free from sin, but we are also free from the law. And how are we free from the law? Because we have entered into the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because of that, sin and the law have no reign over us. The law has been fulfilled and sin has no power. Now that's the conclusion that Paul comes to at the end of chapter 7. And as he is about to enter into chapter 8, he starts chapter 8, he starts this conclusion by saying these words. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I think that my teenagers might be tired of hearing this at this point because we went over Romans this morning in chapter 8 and uh, we've talked about it in length even lately. But that statement that Paul makes here at the beginning of chapter 8 is an incredibly powerful statement. And in preparing for this lesson today, I always try to challenge myself. I only ever want to preach things that I need to hear myself and so the question that I pose to you is the question that I had to ask myself, and that is, what does grace mean to you? And if I'm being honest, I don't think enough about what grace means to me. I don't think enough about what it's done to my life. 
But if I really focus hard and I really look at what, what does grace mean to me, I am met with a reality that I am a very broken individual. I spent a lot of my life trying to forget that grace existed, which seems sad, it seems odd, it seems unusual, but the truth is I didn't want to think about grace. It was so much easier in my mind to hate myself, to pretend as though I hadn't been forgiven, as though I couldn't be forgiven. And I don't know what it is about the way that we live, but so often we'll find ourselves in a place where we don't feel like we can be forgiven or shouldn't be forgiven or we, we refuse to forgive ourselves. And somewhere in the back of our minds, if I'm, if I'm being honest, I, I think it has to be that we think that we alone possess the ability and the power to be more sinful than God can forgive and more broken than God can mend. Because we underestimate the power of God and we overestimate the power of ourselves. But in understanding that hatred towards myself and being unwilling to accept the grace of Christ, being unwilling to recognize the forgiveness that Christ has extended to me, not only did I understand hate in myself, but I've also understood what it is to hate another. I believe grace is... Beautiful and grace to me means that I don't have to know hatred. And if there's one thing our world understands, and it does not understand grace, but it certainly understands hatred. Hatred is a, a universal language, unfortunately. It's one that all people see and recognize and understand, and all people may look at it and say, well, we need to eliminate that. We need to get rid of that. But never would they be willing to step forward and find the solution to that, which is grace. Grace is what sets us apart as Christians. It's what makes us different. And this is what is so powerful to me about grace. We see, starting in verse 2, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. It is incredible to me because I am not good enough. I am very well aware of that fact. Sometimes I forget. Sometimes I forget. My wife is well aware of that. Sometimes I forget that I'm not good enough, but sometimes I am met with that very strong reality that I am not good enough. None of us are. And while it would be easy for me to look at all my faults and flaws and, and focus on those things and bring those things to light and focus on how broken I am and how messed up I am and all the mistakes that I make, I recognize that this is not about me. It never has been. Even the law was never about what we could accomplish. When God offered the law, which by the way, the law that God offered through Moses to the people of Israel, was a perfect law. It wasn't broken. There wasn't anything wrong with the law. The problem was not with the law, but it was with people. But it wasn't about what they could accomplish in the law. Yet that's what they made it about. The people of Israel, notoriously, started to develop this concept that they were so much better than everybody else because they had the law. And look, they followed the law. Many of them tried to fulfill the law, but the fact of the matter was none of them possessed the capacity to fulfill the law. They may be able to follow the law to a point, but at some point they had broken the law. And that is also recognized in the law, that they would sin, that they would make mistakes. And every time they would, there would, be half, there would have to be some kind of payment made. Something would have to be done in order to pay for that sin. 
And whether that price that was paid was something small, like a fine or, or giving something up, or whether that price was their life, was death itself, whatever that price was, there had to be some kind of propitiation for that sin. Violating the law. When Christ came, He came within the law, and He fulfilled the law. And he, it, we, we understand that He says, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. But what does that mean? What it means is this, that Jesus Christ came to be a propitiation for our sins. That while the, the law itself was limited by our weak flesh, and what, we were, what only we were capable of, the law, given our weak flesh, could never save us from our sin. There would always be sin for us to go back to. The law would always be there to condemn us, no matter what. Because no matter what, we would constantly be having to pay for our sins, because no matter how much we paid, it would never be enough, because we are weak. We are not enough. We are not good enough. And the law was never about being good enough. As a matter of fact, in the book of Deuteronomy, when Moses is giving the law to the people, he says, you need to recognize that God is not choosing you because you're righteous. God is not choosing you because you're the best or the biggest or the brightest or the strongest. He's picking you because you were the least, because you were weak. And he's giving this to you so that you can understand what it is to have a relationship with God. But also that you can understand how broken you are. How in need of God's forgiveness and God's guidance that you are. That is what the law was meant to provide. It was never a route to salvation. And when Christ comes, He, He becomes the route to salvation. How? Because He became the propitiation of our sins. He paid the ultimate price, the price that whatever sin had been committed was the highest price could be paid. There is no sin that we could commit that Jesus Christ did not pay the price for when he died on the cross. But better yet, we know in Romans chapter 6 that Christ did not stay dead. We know that we were united with him in his death. And that in that we die to sin and to the law, but something even greater than that happened because Jesus Christ did not stay dead, did he? He got up out of the grave. He rose and he walks in a new life. He lives again and because we have shared in his death, we also share in his resurrection if we have entered into the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ through baptism. That is beautiful. We know if we have entered into that death, burial, and resurrection that our sins are forgiven. The price for our sins have been paid. And that is why Paul is able to say here in chapter 8, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The law has been fulfilled. Not abolished, fulfilled. It no longer has power because there is no sin great enough that God cannot forgive it. Now, there was a time in my life where I had a hard time understanding this. A hard time wrapping my head around the fact that my sins could possibly all be forgiven. And it didn't matter how broken I was or how messed up I was that I could be forgiven. But that's not the only reason that Paul is trying to write to the Romans here. Because remember what is happening in the Roman church. There is division. There is hatred between brothers and sisters in Christ. Not only is this a recognition, a recognition of the fact that we ourselves have been set free from sin, that we ourselves are no longer condemned, but it means that each and every one of our brothers and sisters in Christ stands free and clear apart from the condemnation of the law and of sin. And therefore, we have no right to hold ourselves above anyone. Now, that's another thing that I struggled with. It's another thing that I have found myself entrapped with before. Because if you understand hatred of yourself, it's really easy to understand hatred of others. And if you understand hatred of others, you're certainly going to put yourself above them. You're, cert you're certainly going to try to put yourself and say, look at me, look how much better I am. Look how belittled they are. 
Like the Pharisee that Jesus talks about who goes and prays and he says, Lord God, I'm so glad I'm not like this tax collector. But Christ himself said, if you want to know who walked away justified in that situation, it was the lowly tax collector who looked at God and said, God, I do not deserve your grace. I do not even deserve to look up to the sky. I don't deserve anything that you've given me. But God, I am thankful for what I have. I am thankful for who you are. And I'm thankful that you have created me. Hatred is not... Fitting in the world of grace that we have been saved by. It does not fit with a Christian. It does not fit with living a life changed by Christ. Whether that's a hatred of ourselves and a hatred towards others. And so, grace, if we are to ask ourselves what grace means to us, it shouldn't simply be, well, it's that thing we talk about in church every now and then. It's that thing we talk about in church that's supposed to make us feel good. No, grace is something that is challenging. Because it's not just grace that's been given to me and, oh, I can now be free in Christ and that is wonderful and that is good, but it doesn't just extend to us. Grace manifests through us as a church. It is something we all share in together. It is something that defines who we are in Christ. And if we go out into the world and we are not living a life of grace, then we are not living the life that Christ has called us to. But has grace really changed our lives? Has grace really changed who we are? When we understand that our sins are forgiven, when we understand that through Christ we are no longer captives to sin, has grace changed us? Or do we continue to live ensnared by the things of this world as our identity tied to the things that we have so often tied ourselves to through the world? Do we look at grace or do we look at people the way the world would have us look at them, or do we look at them through the lens of grace that is seen in Christ Jesus? I want to argue to you today that there is nothing in your life that can be more radically changing than grace, and Paul would argue the same. It is because of grace that Paul writes this in verse 37, or sorry, in verse 31. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written for your sake? We are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Is there a more reassuring statement ever spoken? This statement should change us. When we look at the rest of the world and we say, I don't need grace because I really need to overcome this. I don't need grace because I really need to put this person in their place. I don't need grace because I'm looking for success. I don't need the power of God in my life because I'm going to handle this myself. I can't tell you how many times I've fallen into that trap, but look at what is provided if we are willing to set ourselves aside and allow grace to change our lives. Paul says, there is no power which exists that can condemn us while we are in Christ Jesus. That means one of two things. If we're a Christian, it means that that defines who we are. We are who Christ has made us to be. We are changed by the blood of Christ and we live as those who are living under the example and the grace of Christ Jesus. That's what that means for us. For those who are not in Christ, it means this is the only hope that you are going to be able to find. The world cannot offer you this. Everything that the world has to offer you can be overcome by something. 
Everything that the world has to offer you is temporary. It it is not going to last, and it is never going to give you fulfillment. But the thing that we find in Christ Jesus is that our sin can be forgiven. The wrongs that we have done no longer have to define us. We can be defined not by our mistakes, but rather by the grace of Christ Jesus, who is willing to give his life for each and every one of us. As though there was no record it ever existed, we can be cleansed. If you are not a Christian today, that is the hope of the gospel that is extended to you right here and right now. And there is only one solution and there is only one way to find this true hope. The world will not give it to you. You cannot buy it. You cannot earn enough likes on social media for it. You cannot climb this corporate ladder enough to find it. The only place you are going to find it is at the foot of the cross in Christ Jesus. And if we as Christians are not showing this love and showing this grace to the world, we have missed our purpose. So I want to ask you, what does grace mean to you? If it means you need to change your life today, then I encourage you to do that. And I don't know what that is for you. Whether that is that you've never become a Christian, you've never entered into the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ in baptism, or whether that is that you have forgotten what it is to be a Christian, that you have entered into that death, burial, and resurrection, but you've forgotten your identity in Christ, or whether that is that you are going through a difficult time, and it feels like some of the things in your life are insurmountable. Paul reminds us that because of the grace of God, there is nothing that can separate us from the truly most important thing in our life, and that is the love of God. Whatever it is that you need today, I want to encourage you, as together we stand and sing.